Facing hostility and harassment, extortion and attack in some of the most dangerous places in the world. But is there a greater cost to aid groups for the work they perform? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Jane Dutton. They chase new and developing conflicts around the world, rushing in to set up field hospitals and provide emergency food supplies, and often at great risk to themselves. But are aid workers being forced to pay a bigger price to carry out their work? A new report looks at the case of aid groups in Somalia forced to work with members of Al-Shabaab, considered a terrorist group by the United States and who view aid workers with extreme suspicion. And so these workers face a delicate balancing act, cooperating and compromising with an armed group to ensure that aid reaches the victims of famine. The report found that aid workers were forced into sometimes highly unethical deals with Al-Shabaab. The armed group sought to control aid agencies through a system of regulation, taxation and surveillance. Aid groups were forced to pay as much as $10,000 to register their work. They would then have to disclose project details, their budgets and even staff members' names. They were then sometimes forced to pay so-called additional taxes and Al-Shabaab would occasionally co-opt the delivery of aid supplies. Get to our panel in a moment. First, Peter Grester has more on this inside story from Nairobi. Delivering aid to conflict zones is always fraught with moral, legal and ethical dilemmas. And so it was for the agencies trying to help people make it through the drought in 2011 in Somalia. Back then, Al-Shabaab controlled most of the zones that were worst hit by the drought. Of course, Al-Shabaab was trying to overthrow the government. An official count of the dead estimated that more than a quarter of a million people perished because they couldn't get enough food to eat. At the time, Al-Shabaab expelled several aid agencies that it accused of violating their regulations and they imposed strict conditions on anyone wanting to work there. But it really wasn't clear just how strict those conditions were until today's report. Now, according to the joint study, Al-Shabaab set up a special office for coordinating humanitarian aid, but that now seems more like an agency intended to tax and control the aid. The report's authors said that other laws designed to stop aid going to groups accused of terrorism, like Al-Shabaab, forced the agencies to negotiate undercover rather than abandon their humanitarian mission altogether. Of course, these things are never clear-cut in conflict zones, and aid agencies are always having to cut deals, make very difficult compromises, and accept some very unpalatable conditions just to work and at times even to survive. But the alternative is to do nothing and that means leaving many more people to suffer and die as a result. But what the, the authors of this report have highlighted perhaps more than anything else is the very difficult moral world that existed for aid agencies back in 2011 and to a lesser extent still exists today. This is Peter Grester for Inside Story in Nairobi. Well, there's obviously plenty to talk about with our guests in Mogadishu. One of the authors of this latest report, Abdi Ayante, director of the Heritage Institute for Policy Studies. Joining us from Dublin is Mark Dubois, executive director of Doctors Without Borders. And in our London studios, we have Richard Downden, director at the Royal African Society. A warm welcome to you all. Abdi, let me start off with you, a fascinating and rather disturbing report you helped compile. Were you surprised at how much of this goes on? Not so much, actually. I think it was uh, very much quite uh, well known that there was a, uh, an, uh, an attempt by uh, Al-Shabaab to try and co-opt aid agencies. I think what this report reveals is the extent that aid agencies were willing to compromise and uh, uh, work with um, groups that are considered sometimes terrorist organizations like Al-Shabaab to deliver much needed humanitarian assistance and actually save lives. If it would not have been the compromise and the cooperation of aid agencies in Somalia who certainly face a, a huge dilemma as they work in one of the most difficult environments in the world, 
um, uh, one could argue that more people would have died in the 2011 famine, which killed about uh, 260,000 people already. How did you compile and access this sort of information? What did you find out about the way Al Shabab exploits, if I can put it that way, these aid agencies? Well, this report is based on months of research and more than 80 interviews with key informants, including uh, recipients of aid, aid agency workers themselves, and former uh, people, people who have worked at the Humanitarian Coordination's office, which is a, an al-Shabaab outfit designed to uh, essentially supervise uh, aid, uh, aid agencies in Somalia. And so uh, what we've been able to do then is sketch the extent to which al-Shabaab was able to exploit um, the um, compromise and the determination, the sheer determination of aid agencies to deliver assistance in one of the most difficult um, places in the world and one of the most difficult times. And so um, the key finding here is that there was a, a genuine attempt by aid agencies to deliver assistance, but that you had on the other side a player which is determined to uh, extract as much money as possible from aid agencies, but at the same time subject to them to quite an intrusive regime of surveillance and, uh, um, and uh, monitoring of their activities and monetizing sometimes a lot of their activities. So, um, arguably, Al Shabaab has uh, been able to portray itself as a government to the to Mark recipients Dubois, of aid MSF in the areas it controls. Has had first-hand experience of just this in Somalia. Tell us about what you found. Well, you know, as Abdi has just said, uh, the situation in Somalia is a very difficult one, and it's it's one where an organization like MSF. You know, our focus is first and foremost on, on the people, the, the people that are victims of armed conflict or famine or whatever, and who are in desperate need of, uh, of assistance. And, you know, we, we don't, you know, uh, our neutrality says to us that we really can't pick sides uh, in conflict. We can't decide which government is a good government, which organized group is a bad government, a bad group, who's a freedom fighter, who's a terrorist. You know, th those kinds of judgments will get you nowhere. Uh, in the end, People, often people with guns, control access to the territory where we have to go. And we look at it as, a, you know, it is a form of negotiation with the local authorities. I mean, as Abdi just talked uh, uh, about, you know, the, the Al-Shabaab group had set up a, a government. They had policies around aid. They had a humanitarian coordinating office. Um, uh, you know, it, it is, they are acting as a local authority and we, we negotiate with them as all no, local authorities. And there are plenty of local authorities that are very cooperative and assist us and, and uh, you know, have taxes, income taxes placed on the salaries we pay, import taxes pay on, on the, the goods we bring in, um, other kinds of registration fees. That's, it's, a, it's a very common practice with, with democratically elected, with uh, internationally recognized governments and with a warlord controlling two cities. So it's, it, you know, that's the world in which we work and we have to be able to negotiate. I think the point is that you negotiate really from a, a very robust structure. You don't, you, you, you can't simply go in without any, any sense of, uh, 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 you know, of, of really what the limits are and, and how far you're willing to go. And that's, that's the difficult question. Okay, Mark, yes. how far are you prepared to be exploited then? Well, we wouldn't use the word exploited, of course, but I think the first question is what's the situation on the other side? I mean, obviously the, the famine in South Central Somalia was, uh, was a situation in which life and, uh, life and death were really in the balance for hundreds of thousands of people and how far you're willing to compromise to maintain your access to that kind of a population is of course different from a, a population that doesn't have that that level of mortality um, and the, the the question i guess comes back to you know what are our, what are our red lines in the sand i think there's always one red line and that is that we 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 have to have free access to people in terms of 
who we treat. We can't be treating people based on their affiliation where one group or one ethnic group or one religious group would gain access to us, but others wouldn't. That's called impartiality. The other is I think we really try and hold back. For instance, in Somalia, we said we weren't going to pay registration fees. And uh, you know, I can give you the example in Marere, in one of the projects there, we said no. They were, we were being asked for six to 10,000 in sort of a, a tax or a registration fee. And we simply said that that was, that was too much. It didn't seem like a, a registration fee at that point. It seemed like funding. And we, we, we held back from paying that. But what, what al-Shabaab did is they went and, and pushed the community and, and pushed the elders in the community to sort of pony up that registration fee for us, you might say. Uh, in other words, they taxed the community in, in the absence of us, you know, really being comfortable with the idea that we would, would send our money directly to al-Shabaab that way. Okay. Richard, do you think this way of operating by aid agencies is acceptable or is it rather an unholy alliance with warmongers? I think what Mark's saying is uh, I couldn't really disagree with, um, but that's the, the good side of the aid agencies. You also have to remember that these famines, particularly a war caused famines, are amazingly good opportunities for fundraising. If you can get your logo um, there and say we're helping out, your funds just go through the roof. And I, I, I saw this in, in, uh, in Somalia in, in the very early days in 1992, and I, I was there then. And also then the, the worst of all was in Goma in 1994 after the Rwandan genocide, where the aid agencies were fighting among themselves to get themselves on television, to get their logo shown uh, so that they could raise funds on the back of it. So I think that's, that's one danger. The other, I think, is that Yes, you are operating with some pretty nasty groups who are not particularly interested uh, in helping everybody. And I, I'm glad that Mark made that point because in several places I've been to, uh, yes, you can feed those people over there because they're on our side, but you can't feed those people over there. And I think the, the Sudan war was the greatest example of that, where there was this cynical negotiation between the Sudan government, the SPLA, the the, the, the southern movement and the aid agencies about where food could be taken and, and why. And often, what often happened was the aid agencies would then drop food uh, in places where the, diff the armies could pick it up rather than the people, and it was stolen. And this sort of thing never came out. Uh, and, they, they, it, and that's why I'm slightly worried about this idea, oh, well, you know, that's the way it is. You have to go along with it. I think when something like that happens, no, you don't. You say, no, we're out of here and we're going to publicize this as much as we can. OK, let's push on what you're saying there, Richard. Aid groups have come under fire in the past for misdirecting their work. Millions of dollars were sent to help Ethiopia's famine in the 1980s. But critics say some money ended up in the hands of rebels who used it to buy weapons and aid agencies were accused of getting it seriously wrong following the Rwandan genocide when their efforts focused on helping the Hutu killers of the Tutsis. Even now, concerns are being raised about Syria where aid groups must cooperate with either the government or rebels. It can mean supplies and medicines can be used to help only certain groups. Mark, MSF is operating in Syria. How do you operate there and how do you get that balance? Yeah, I, I think one of the ways we get that balance is by really rigorous debate inside the organization because, of course, people have, have different opinions of how far they will go. Um, I think we're known as an organization that will draw a line in the sand. I mean, in Ethiopia in 1984, when we saw that a lot of the food aid was being misused and being used against the people, uh, we, with, we essentially criticized it. And we knew we would be expelled for that. Uh, we withdrew from the camps uh, where the, uh, the Hutu genocidaire were actually using the supply of aid to rearm themselves and things like that. Uh, those are the camps in Goma that Richard just mentioned. And in Syria today, you know, we have the very, very difficult circumstance where it is impossible to get aid into many of the enclaves in a way in which we would want to do that. And what I mean by that is to be able to distribute the aid through our own organization, through our own sort of network of people where we're able to monitor where it goes in the end and, and to be able to measure what happens to it and, and to see and control what happens to it. 
And it, it's a very, you know, these are excruciating decisions because at the same time, you know, that aid is vital. And the, the, there is simply not enough medical care, health care, medicines, drugs, or food getting into these places. And it's, it, it's just a very, very difficult balance. And I think what you do is try and make sure that people understand you are an actor with principles, have those difficult negotiations, ask for proof, you know, really follow up on, on, on organizations and what you're being promised and what you're being told and, and, you know, making sure that, you know, that that aid and not being afraid to go back to them and say, we aren't happy with this situation. We aren't happy with the way, for instance, you're taxing our, our local staff or things like that. But, uh, you know, the situation in Syria today is, is a horrible one. And, you know, the, the Damascus government has simply not given authorization of aid agencies to enter into uh, the areas where people need aid the most. Richard, that obviously raises the question of sovereignty. I mean, does the issue of sovereignty matter when it comes to getting aid to people? Well, if, you, if, if there's no other way, then no, it doesn't. But I think they, they, the sovereignty issue is you, you have to obviously negotiate it with the, with the, the power that, that is there. And if it's not a legitimate power, that's the big question, is how you, ne how you uh, relate to that. And do you then accept to be taxed by rebel movements, by really bad rebel movements? And then what percentage do you pay? But all I would say is, yes, it is, as Mark says, it's a very hard decision, but at least be open about it. And so I, I'm just very suspicious of aid agencies who make huge claims for what they're doing without mentioning this dark side, the difficult side, where they know maybe 20, 30 percent, 40 percent, even more perhaps, is actually being sip siphoned off, may be spent on guns, will be spent on the, on the war, um, and um, they, they have to accept that. And I think the, the only option is to be completely open about it and say, that's what we're doing. Abdi, mentioning the dark side, as Richard put it, is it going to have some sort of impact on aid uh, to these organizations from donors? Well, certainly. I mean, obviously, aid organizations are trying to put the best face they can to their organizations and to the operations they run. I would like to believe that many of them are good people who are trying to do good things. But as Richard said, obviously, they are also prone to errors and mistakes and are not always um, forthcoming um, with uh, some of the mistakes and errors that take place. I think in the case of Somalia, though, and uh, particularly in the report that we just did, um, our finding is that aid agencies have actually tried to do the best they can by engaging with a group that is largely seen as a terrorist organization and by um, leveling with them and uh, trying to uh, focus on their main objective, which is to reach the vulnerable population. I think they have done um, a, a relatively good job considering the difficult environments that they work and considering the people that they've engaged with. Al-Shabaab was essentially focused on making money out of aid organizations, and one could argue that they have been somewhat successful in that. Now, we've touched on the fact that aid work is often viewed with suspicion. In one case, aid workers say has caused immeasurable damage to their reputations in Pakistan. It involves the CIA's hunt for Osama bin Laden. In the weeks before the al-Qaeda leader was killed, the CIA told a Pakistani doctor to set up a fake vaccination scheme in the town of Abbottabad so they could try to gain access to bin Laden's house. When news got out, it cast doubt on the integrity of aid workers. 200 U.S. aid groups wrote to the CIA linking the ploy to a polio crisis in Pakistan. Since then, at least one aid group, Save the Children, has had to pull out their staff because of concerns over their safety. Mark, what more do you know about the impact that this has had on aid workers in Pakistan and elsewhere? Well, I, I think you've mentioned a, a really serious case but it goes further than that. I mean, what happens when, for instance, you have the British government talking in, uh, about its own aid expenditures and justifying them in the interest of its own national security? I mean, in the end, you, you mentioned that word trust. And an aid agency, without the trust of the people on the ground, that, what, you know, that our business is simply to deliver care, 
not to build the legitimacy of the state, not to help win hearts and minds in some kind of larger conflict. People, and in particular the people with the guns, have to believe that we are there without an ulterior agenda. And that goes beyond just the spying agenda that you just mentioned in that, in that polio vaccination case. So it is, it is a very, very difficult situation when you have you know, in, in, in often a Western government that is a belligerent in a war, for instance, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and also where they are using aid in order to win the hearts and minds and instrumentalizing aid in their own to accomplish their own objectives. And that, that means that essentially the other side, whether it's the, you know, the Taliban or Al Qaeda or, or any other group, they might see us as the enemy. They might see us as a group that is acting, that that aid is being put in, you know, to service to accomplish the goals of their enemy. And, so, Richard, you know, it really creates a horrible situation. Sure. What about then rather putting this aid into the hands of locals, educating them to, to take on the role of the international community, to build up the trust that way? That's what I think a lot of more aid agencies are doing these days. But again, the locals don't have, of course, they don't have neutrality either by being local. Uh, they may be more vulnerable than foreign aid workers, but I, I, I would, on the other hand, they, at least they know what the situation is. And I think that was, I think of, of one example there was during the war in Ethiopia, uh, where um, I think it was, well, there was a Catholic aid agency was feeding uh, the humanitarian wing of the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front across the border. And they were actually doing, they'd been over there, they'd seen it, they were, they were running clinics and schools and things like that. And it was actually be, being used quite well. But they were the aid arm of a rebel movement, of a internationally recognized, uh, again, fighting against an internationally recognized state. So they took that risk and it came off. But I think that's a very, it is a dangerous game to play that because you've really got to know exactly where that's going. And I think in the case of, you know, somewhere like Shabab, if it was found that, you know, a major aid agency was actually uh, willingly cooperating with, with al-Shabaab or something, I mean, that would be, I mean, it would, would just be devastating for the aid business. So I think they've got to keep their distance from them. And, I, and, I, and I'll, what I find again and again is that they begin to get, you know, the sort of Stockholm syndrome and they begin to think like they do. And uh, I'm not saying this is going to happen in Somalia, but um, you know, they, they come on side with them. And I think that that means that they've lost the neutrality they should have. OK, Abdi, I mean, do you think if agencies are to be held more accountable because they are breaking uh, laws in some areas when they are seen to be dealing with uh, people who are known to be terrorists, I mean, would that just then push this uh, way of operating underground? Well, one of the findings of the report is that because of the existing counterterrorism laws in the U.S., um, many of the aid agencies who are now interacting with al-Shabaab are doing this underground. They're, they're not ready to come out and declare that they're doing this at all. Um, because they will be exposed and they will be prosecuted for this. And, and one of the recommendations we're making is that there are possibly uh, that Western countries revisit these counterterrorism laws. However, that has to be balanced with this other uh, dilemma that aid agencies face, which, you know, as Richard and Mark said, if you have a government, so to speak, in this case, if you have a group uh, controlling a largest weight of land in South Central Somalia and acting like the government of it, Aid agencies have to deal with these people and negotiate access, and that's what they're doing. And unless there is a clarified code and um, some sort of an agreement among aid agencies, but also with authorities in the West on counterterrorism and money laundering laws, these things will continue to be done underground. Mark, is being on the front line still the most effective way to save lives, regardless of the moral debate and the cost? No, I, I mean, I, I really think we need to have that moral debate. Um, I, I am completely in favor of the idea that we, you know, we need to, we need to put our best foot forward and in the public as aid agencies. And I think the best foot is an honest foot. I, I think the public needs to understand just how complex these situations are. That, you know, going over to the dark side, that's the way it looks. But it might be that the only other alternative is the darker side. Where you, where you pull out and hundreds of thousands of people are placed at risk. Uh, we aren't faced, often we aren't faced with decisions where there's a good path and a bad path. It is really a choice between what's the least worst option here 
and what compromises i mean we call them compromises where you know what are we going to give away in terms of a little bit of neutrality a little bit of our independence in order to be able to access people in in absolutely desperate need and what a horrible dilemma gentlemen thank you very much for discussing this with us on inside story abdi ayante mark dubois and thank richard you. dowden don't forget, you can find this program and many more at facebook.com slash AJ Inside Story. And why not like us while you're there? I'm Jane Dutton. Thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.